A couple of weeks ago, many of you will have seen me take a road trip to a road here in the UK that I'd always wanted to go to, the Snake Pass. I did it in an EV, a Jaguar I-Pace. The I-Pace didn't let me down, it was a great car. When I got there, the road certainly didn't let me down. It was an amazing place to drive a car along. But what did frustrate the hell out of me on that journey was the charging network, the infrastructure that's there to support this adoption of EVs that the government and everybody is so hopeful can move the transportation industry forward. I'm having an absolute nightmare. I absolutely hate it. it drives me mad, it frustrates the hell out of me. It prompted a number of questions in the comments section, many of which were negative around electric vehicles. And that may be no major surprise. We've got a channel here built on motorsport fans, people who love a noisy, gas guzzling, screaming V8 engine. I'll put my hand up and say I'm definitely one of those. But I'm also a huge supporter of electric vehicles. I'm a huge fan of the technology, the experience being behind the wheel of an EV, I can promise you in general is a really, really good one. So what I didn't want to do was leave that video on a negative note. I didn't want to leave all the people that have sent in responses or questions to that video without some sort of satisfactory answer. Well, I'm delighted to say that after that video, I got an email to say that the Vice President of Sales from Europe of ChargePoint, one of the biggest networks in Europe for EV charging points, has agreed to join me on a call. He's here today. You'll be able to see him on the screen. Uh, Andre, um, thank you so much for, for agreeing to do this. Um, as you know, because you've just told me you've been following my YouTube channel for a while, so you do know that I'm a big fan and supporter of the electric vehicle movement and this transition to electrification. I mean, let's start by saying that on that particular journey, my biggest problem was that I tapped in, you know, the car technology is amazing nowadays, isn't it? Um, it is. So I tapped into the car system where I was going. Of course, it tells you what's the best point or the most efficient point to stop, how long you'll need to stop there for, where the charger is and that kind of thing. I followed all of that. But when I got there, the charger that I was hoping to use was effectively out of order. And it's not the first time that this has happened to me. And my biggest worry about this when I'm trying to help convince people to take up electric vehicles is that one little incident like that can be enough to knock people's confidence and really set them back a long way in terms of being convinced that they can get to where they want to go. Absolutely right. And, you know, it, it should not happen. You should not have received the wrong information about the state of that particular charge station. That plug can only effectively work if it communicates with the rest of the world. So what you first of all need is a connected plug or a connected charge station. You see in, in a lot of other European countries, you see that all the plugs are connected, all the stations are connected. And presumably if you're, a, if you're an EV owner and you're looking on the app on your screen or you have one of these apps on your smartphone, presumably the only things that shows up is are connected plugs nowadays. All of those apps have different sources of data. And some of those apps simply use a published source of data which says the point where a certain station is located. Nothing more, nothing less. And it doesn't even get access to the actual uh, status of that station, regardless of whether it's broken or not. It's as bad if you turn up at that station and it's occupied. Yeah. And if it's occupied for four hours and you have to queue up for four hours, that's not what you want, right? No, no. But that, that's where you get to the next level of intelligence whereby you can provide wait lists or whereby you can provide, you know, the actual status of the station, which is all available already. It's not future, it's here today. Okay. So I've had, I have had that experience as well. So let's just say that I've had some really positive experiences with this too, where exactly that, you know, the app tells you how many charge stations are there, how many are currently being used, you know, how long it's been used for. So how, how likely is it that it's coming to the end of its use? And, and that system works really well. And those are the experiences that I really want to share with people. It's just that on that day, I didn't have that. So how do we overcome that as a network? You know, we've got at the moment, we've got lots of individual networks. We've got yours. We've, there's a lot of other networks yeah. that, you know, people have to sign up for different apps, different accounts. They all pay in different ways. How do we bring all of that together to make sure that no matter where somebody wants to stop on a journey, 
they're getting that information that you just talked about in a very clear and concise way, perhaps through one common app. It is available in many countries in Europe. Okay. So interestingly enough, many countries in Europe and many countries in the world, by the way, have adopted a what is called a roaming strategy. Roaming strategy is that you are able with one app to get access to multiple stations or network operators. And it's the same with the mobile technology. So if you, with your mobile phone, go into Europe and you go to France, you can still make a phone call, you can still be reached. That's yeah. roaming. Yeah. It's the same in, in EV. So we are able, in many countries, to use the app and get access to another station. We as ChargePoint, we provide access to over 115,000 stations in Europe. Seamless. It, you know, you yeah. pay what is set as price by the charge point owner, there is no surcharge, you have access and you have visibility on the status of that station. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the UK, that roaming idea has not been adopted yet. The good news is there is a lot of discussion around it. The good news is that the government seems to go into a direction that they also want to open up all the networks to make use of each other to have that seamless experience. And then you cover two things. One is you get access with one app or one token or one RFID card or whatever you use yeah. to get access to all of those stations. And secondly, the information and the status of those stations can be easily absorbed in that app and represented to you. And that sounds perfect. That sounds like exactly what we need. Why is it that the UK hasn't yet adopted that? Uh, I, I can't tell you. But do you think it's more of a, a private company issue or at a government level? The government can enforce it. Mm -hmm. The market should have adopted it immediately. Yeah. There is no government in the rest of Europe uh, that has enforced it so far. It seems that it has to be enforced by government in the UK to get there. Okay, so the competition between these individual networks is at the moment preventing them from working together. At least the conversations are happening and, and that's there seems like there's a desire to open up that roaming ability in the UK. So hopefully that's that's on the way. I mean, it can't come quickly enough really is, is what I would say. Um, what about the, the sort of um, the levels of charging uh, capability in terms of the uh, speed of charging, um, the power of the of the charge points? Because the other issue that's cropped up for me a few times, and I'm sure for lots of people, is that you can you know, find your way on a journey to a charge point, which is one of the older, lower power, seven kilowatt or something, um, which, which almost seems useless in the public domain because if you're out on a, motor, on a motorway stopping for a break, you don't want to be stopping for hours and hours. We want to be stopping for 45 minutes or something. Um, here we have to go a little bit in the technology of charging. So you have, if you look at electricity in the grids in, uh, the, that you also see in the UK, you have three-phase grids and you have one-phase grids. Yeah. Take it as, um, if you look at the tap for water, you have water taps whereby the tap actually is three taps or it's only one. Yeah. yeah. The speed with which the water runs through that tap determines how many power in the end can go through that tap into your car. Yeah. What you experience at the charge station side is the number of taps that that station provides to the car. Okay. Then at the car end, you also need to be able to get three hoses in at the same time instead of one. If we have the technology that allows us to charge faster, why aren't car companies doing that on a much bigger scale? It's, it's an interesting question. So if you look at the charging behavior at this moment of the general person driving a car, you see that about 40 to 45 percent of all the sessions are done at home. Yeah. 40 to 45 percent of all the rest of the sessions are done at the workplace. And there is 10 to 20 percent, depending a little bit on, on the specific circumstance and, and which country you look at. But between 10 and 20 percent is what we call in transit. The in transit bit is the only bit where speed really counts. Because your yeah. car is sitting normally at least eight hours at your workplace yeah. or it's sitting at least 12 hours at your home. In 12 hours, even at seven kilowatt, you can charge any battery completely. Yeah. Yeah. 
So generally, when you start your journey with an EV, your battery is full. Yeah. Instead of generally, when you start with an ICE, you have something in the tank, but not everything. Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing to realize. So that, that's why people say, you know, seven kilowatt is enough, because for the general use case that works out. Then for the 10 to 20 percent in transit, you need more speed because you don't want to sit four hours and read a paper or, or do some work or whatever you can do yeah. and wait. What you have at the workplace and what you have at home is AC, alternating current. There is a maximum of 22 kilowatt that you can do there. Yeah. If you want to do more, you have to go to DC. No home can provide that. No. It's all very expensive. Yeah, and so it is important to say that the issues that I had are very much on the uh, the smaller scale of what anyone will encounter because, as you rightly say, for most people, you're charging your car up and every morning it's just full, the battery's full. And for most people, the range of a modern, you know, reasonably priced electric car is going to get you through your day without having to stop anywhere else. So yeah. that's the biggest thing to, to say to everybody is that having to stop on the roadside to charge your car up is a... It's not the norm. And if you're going to do the snake bars anyway, which, you know, it, it seems like a lovely place to, to drive. It was, yeah. <laughs> plan for it. Yeah. I, I, I took five minutes uh, to look at, you know, where you started to snake bars, whether you could have done it, you know, only touching the high speed charges. Yeah. You could have easily planned it for them. I think that's absolutely true. I could have definitely planned that journey better but what I was really hoping for was the technology on board the car or on the app that I was using would, would help me to do that better. So I actually followed the sort of instructions that the, uh, the apps were giving me, which told me to go to that particular charge point. And yet you're absolutely right, you know, with a bit more experience, I would have probably searched out a particular charge point and done a bit more digging, but I just followed the information and really, we should be able to do that. This should be a seamless, easy process without having to do your own research. And we can provide that. It's great to know that that's happening and those conversations are happening. Uh, I just want to finish by talking about Tesla because Tesla obviously have their own cars, but they also have their own network. And my experience of Tesla's is pretty much what you're describing, whereas the whole thing is, first of all, high powered. It's all very connected. It's all seamless. It works perfectly well. Is that the kind of experience that we should be getting no matter what, which car we're in, which country we're in, which part of the country we're in, we should have the same sort of thing, shouldn't we? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. If you look at the Instafold network, yeah. uh, they provide that already, and they provide that already in, in big numbers. That's exactly what they build, and the only difference that they have compared to the Tesla example that you use is that Tesla is proprietary and doesn't open up to other brands, whereas they are, of course, accessible to any brand that can charge them. Okay, and then one thing that I know is gonna be in the comments to all of this, because it's in the comments every time I do an electric car video, is talking about the supply of energy that's going to feed the network if we all start driving electric vehicles. Some countries are obviously far more suited to that. The UK, it feels to me like we are still some way off being able to provide enough energy if everybody suddenly wanted to drive an electric car. So are the, are the energy companies, the charging companies and the car companies, are they working together? Is there a conversation going on between everybody about how we achieve that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, which leads to a lot of initiatives. Uh, so one of the things is, if you look at the amount of energy that we need uh, to be supplied to all the cars, there is no real issue in getting that sorted. The real problem is, as I just said, you know, it's for, let's say 40%, 45% of all the charges start at home or at the workplace. Well, look at the congestion in the highways. Everybody is moving and starting to work at the same time. So at the peak of everybody connecting at their workplace and the peak of everybody coming back home and that connecting, that's what you can't cope with. Okay. You can't. We definitely can't. So what you have to do is you have to mitigate that and you have to get people to connect the car, but then the car to be in in communication with the network, yeah. with your agenda, frankly, to allow the car to understand what it needs. So it has to look at the state of charge. So what do I have? What is based on the agenda? 
if it's a business card, mainly driven business card, what is the mileage that I need to do tomorrow? So what is the state of charge that I have to start the day with? What is the price of the energy that I can get hold of in that period? Because you will see that price of energy goes up if the peak is there and price of energy goes down if the peak goes lower. So let me take use of that slower uh, uh, amount of energy that's being asked to the lower price. And then let me start the session and we, we control that, we can control that, do start the session only when the price is at a certain level, only when the availability of power is there. And then mitigate and, and get the peak down and really get to an average which you can handle instead of having to handle the peaks. That's really interesting and it doesn't feel like something that's unachievable. It feels like that technology is there and just needs to be manipulated in the right way. Yeah, correct. How far off that happening do you think we are? Not at all. Okay. Uh, so that, that's even if you look in, in, you need a language to be able to communicate between car and station and grid. And that language is there. It's, it's laid down in an ISO standard. And there are cars coming to market that already can handle that standard and talk in that way. Uh, we support that and the industry will support it within the coming two years that will be you know, the, the common way of doing it. Yeah, great. Well, that's great news and it's really nice. I think we'll, we'll sort of wrap it up there because it's a really nice way to finish on a positive like that because that's always the question that people ask is that, you know, we the government wants everyone to drive electric vehicles, but there's no way we can cope with it. So maybe there are ways to cope with it. It's just about being clever with the technology that we have and getting everybody to be on the same page and, and work together and communicate together. And we can find a solution to this. Because driving an EV, apart from, you know, losing out on, on the noise, which I like as well, yeah. you know, it is a nice experience. Yeah. It? Oh, I can fully vouch for that. And of course, the next thing is, is improving the way we produce our energy to match, isn't it? It's having sustainable energy sources, again, which some countries are far better at than others. But what I guess we can sum this up by saying is that electric vehicle technology is still quite a young technology. It's still in its, its relative infancy if we compare it to, to what else is out there in the transport world. So like anything, there's going to be teething troubles, but it's really encouraging to hear that the conversations around these solutions are already happening. And, uh, and I really appreciate you coming on to explain some of those. With pleasure. Well, Andre, thanks so much. And uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch again at some point. Let's hope so. Thanks, man. Right, man. <laughs>